every European capital has an array of treasures guaranteed to captivate the intrepid traveller. But when visiting Rome, where an ancient civilization meets cutting-edge style, the breathtaking attractions on offer here truly are beyond compare. Once the capital of the most powerful empire on Earth, Rome is one of the most spectacular cities in the world, where the remnants of ancient temples tower above the most exquisite Baroque architecture, while stunning sculptures and frescoes draw your eyes heavenwards. The extraordinary past of this city is still evident in the giant monuments that dominate the skyline wonderful fountains, statues and glorious churches shaped by some of history's most talented artists and architects make it clear that although Rome no longer has an empire, it is without doubt an omnipresent force and still very much at the centre of the Christian world. From magnificent cathedrals and museums to bustling streets and squares, this portrait of a city reveal the eternal beauty of Rome. You'll soon see for yourselves why everyone who comes here will do all that they can to return time and again. To begin our journey through Rome, we'll start with the origins of the city. And at its very heart, you'll find Palatine Hill, where the earliest traces of civilization can be found. Palatine is one of Rome's seven hills, and beneath the ruins that clutter the hillside lie the floors of two or three huts cut out of the rock and the remains of an ancient burial ground dating back to the Iron Age. It's thought that Palatine is also where the city's founders, the twin sons of Mars, the god of war, were discovered as babies. Legend has it that the two boys were suckled by a she-wolf in one of the caves here, and after being found by the shepherd Faustinus when they came of age, the twins, named Romulus and Remus, founded Rome in 753 BC. Romulus became the first king of the city, which took his name, and looking at the ruins around Palatine, you can get an idea of just how grand this kingdom eventually became. Beneath Palatine lies the Imperial Forum, which was once the hub of political, social and commercial life and the very epicentre of the capital. Here, gods were worshipped and battles celebrated, politicians plotted, while great emperors spoke to roaring crowds, and where trees and shrubs now grow amongst the crumbled pillars of once magnificent monuments, you can't help but get a sense of how great this ancient empire once was. Even today, you'll certainly get the sensation that this area is still the epicentre of the capital, and if you make your way to the southern end of the Forum, you'll be greeted with a sight that really lets you know that you're at the heart of Rome and indeed all of Italy. Looming large over the traffic, you'll find it hard to miss the grand arches of the structure that the Emperor Vespasian began building in 72 AD, the magnificent Colosseum. Eventually completed in 80 AD, the inauguration of this extraordinary structure was celebrated with a hundred days of ceremonies and games. The amphitheatre could hold as many as 70,000 people. Here civilians and emperors alike would gather to enjoy such spectacles as the great gladiator contests and the early Christians being fed to the lions. Vast crowds would pour through the arched entrances and climb the tiers of staircases to reach the various levels of the amphitheatre.
while deep below underground passages would house exotic animals from around the Empire and unfortunate slaves, criminals or prisoners of war would be safely locked away until they were called for in the arena to die for the entertainment of the most bloodthirsty audiences. Today, much of the structure has crumbled into ruins. The Colosseum is still an extraordinary site and one of the most iconic landmarks in the entire city. Sadly, by the 4th century AD, the great days of amphitheatres, triumphal arches and magnificent temples were coming to an end. And as Eastern Germanic tribes became an ever greater threat, the vast Roman Empire soon crumbled into ruin and the Dark Ages had begun. As Rome was sacked and pillaged by invaders, it would be many years before the city returned to a fraction of its former glory. But before we discover how the city rose once more to prominence from the dust of its ancient past, we'll take a quick look at one more site which was of great importance to the ancient Romans and still remains politically significant to the city today. On Capitoline Hill, at the northern end of the Forum, the Temple of Jupiter, dating as far back as 512 BC, once stood overlooking the streets and River Tiber far below. The building was a shrine to the most sacred religious ceremonies of the city, and both hill and temple came to symbolise Rome's authority. Although today what's left of the temple is hidden within the Capitoline Museums, which have been since built on this sacred site, the City Council still gathers in the Palazzo Senatorio at the head of the square, ensuring this hill remains as significant in the politics of the city as ever. The museums on either side of the Palazzo Senatorio grace a square that has been beautifully decorated with geometric designs by none other than Michelangelo, one of the greatest Italian Renaissance artists. Michelangelo also designed the facades of the buildings, and at the centre of the carefully balanced ensemble stands a statue of Marcus Aurelius astride his horse, a leader who was recognised as being one of the five good emperors of Rome. The statue is in fact a copy, which you can find the original inside one of the two edifices belonging to the Capitoline Museums, the Palazzo Nuovo. the building there are many other extraordinary finds, such as the Statue of the Dying Gaul, which inspired the great romantic poet Lord Byron to wax lyrical. On the other side of Campidoglio Square, the other main building, the Palazzo Conservatory, displays an equally impressive collection of sculptures and artwork, not least in the main courtyard where the head and body parts of a colossus of the Emperor Constantine can be found. If you take the time to search through the secret treasures of the many rooms within, you'll also find an ancient bronze statue of the famous she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus, as well as glorious paintings by such luminaries as Caravaggio and many more besides. But now it's time to move on and look at a rather different aspect of the city, because after the fall of the Roman Empire, a very different kind of power came into force and took over from the emperors who'd driven Rome to supremacy. Wherever you look, the dominating influence of the church permeates the very fabric of the city and provides an entirely new chapter in the pages of Rome's incredible story. The Dark Ages were pretty grim for the people of Rome, as the beautiful city fell to the destructive mercy of the Goths and other invaders. But Christianity, through what we recognise today as the Catholic Church, was beginning to make its mark. Legend has it that a Sibyl, an ancient fortune teller, 
prophesied the coming of Christ to the Emperor Augustus on the very site where the often missed church of Santa Maria in Aracoeli now stands adjacent to the great Capitoline Museums. By the Middle Ages, this church had become the centre of religious life in the city, and over the centuries, as Catholicism became an ever greater force, Rome's worshipful edifices became more impressive than ever. It's impossible to miss the great cupola of St. Peter's Basilica, which dominates the Roman skyline, and proving as spectacular as any of the pillared ruins in the Imperial Forum, it's easy to understand why millions of pilgrims are drawn from every corner of the world every year to wonder at its grandeur. The square in front of St. Peter's is almost as impressive as the basilica itself. Pausing to take in the surroundings before entering the church is a must. Gian Lorenzo Bernini, one of Italy's greatest Baroque sculptures and architects, designed the square and enveloped in two huge colonnades with rows upon rows of Doric columns, the elliptical space has been hailed a masterpiece of Baroque architecture and is a fitting courtyard for the grand edifice at its head. The facade was designed by Carlo Moderno, Perhaps the most famous element in his grand design is the central window and balcony from where the Pope delivers his solemn benedictions and seasonal blessings to those gathered below. Having explored the outside of the basilica, you'll definitely want to step inside and see the stunningly beautiful interior. Bernini's magnificent sculptures grace the elaborately decorated naves and the ethereal light that pours through Michelangelo's cupola is quite breathtaking. We've only just begun to touch on the treasures of the Vatican City, however, and as you'll soon discover, there are a great many more delights to be found within its walls. After taking in the spectacular views of St. Peter's Basilica, a trip to the Vatican museums nearby will reveal some of the most prized and priceless treasures in the world. A myriad of corridors and rooms filled with stunning frescoes and paintings will not disappoint, and from works of art by Caravaggio to a series of rooms decorated by Raphael, not to mention the classical sculptures wherever you look, a day at the Vatican will take you on a truly mesmerising journey. The Jewel in the Crown is without doubt the Sistine Chapel, with its beautifully decorated ceiling and frescoes by Michelangelo, and side panels designed by the great Renaissance artists Sandro Botticello and Pietro Perugino. The chapel is one of the greatest masterpieces in Western art, and although Michelangelo himself had to endure painting in the most uncomfortable conditions imaginable, as your gaze is drawn to the ceiling and the amazing images he created, there can be no question that this was the crowning achievement in his life's work. In the Sistine Chapel, it's hard to imagine anything but peace and tranquility. And there is actually a Vatican corridor that begins within the walls of the museum, which gave beleaguered popes an escape route when the city was under attack past pontiffs would have hurried along the fortified passageway, the Passetto di Borgo, to a place of safety. In 1527, when Charles V of Spain pillaged the city, destroying countless works of art, Pope Clement VII and his entourage fled along the passageway and owed their survival to the fortified castle that provided refuge at the end of the tunnel. Castel Sant'Angelo was actually never intended to be a fortress. It was originally a mausoleum constructed by Hadrian, another of Rome's five good emperors, who ruled supreme when the empire was at its most powerful. Down through the ages, the castle has had many different functions. But after its days as a fortress, it became a prison, an army barracks, and finally a museum. 
Today, within the thick walls of the castle, there are many corridors and rooms to be explored and artefacts to enjoy. Opera lovers may be aware that the top of the castle was the setting for the last act in Puccini's Tosca. And from here, you can enjoy a wonderful panoramic view of the city and a last lingering look at the impressive dome of St. Peter's Basilica. With your feet firmly back on the ground, while artists gather on the banks of the River Tiber, you'll find another construction that can be attributed to the vision of the Emperor Hadrian. The Ponte Sant'Angelo, or Sant'Angelo Bridge, was originally built in 134 AD. It spans the river connecting the ancient mausoleum to central Rome. This beautifully elegant construction is lined with statues of angels, lovingly shaped by sculptures of the Bernini school. Each one is adorned with instruments from the crucifixion of Christ. The bridge was once a vital route for pilgrims as they travelled to St. Peter's Basilica. And though today many more bridges span the River Tiber, Ponte Sant'Angelo is still a popular crossing provides a truly picturesque addition to the Roman landscape. Adrian's enthusiasm for architecture, however, went way beyond bridges and mausoleums. And if you wander into Piazza della Rotonda, a charming square on the other side of the river, you'll discover that one building dominates the space more than any other. of course talking about the Pantheon. No matter how many times you see it, you will always feel a sense of surprise and wonderment that something so ancient can still be so beautiful. This great domed temple, with all the resonance of the towering monuments that fill the Imperial Forum, was built by Hadrian in 218 AD to the design of the great Marcus Vipsanius of Ever a fair and just emperor, Hadrian ensured that Agrippa was credited and had a dedication engraved that can still be seen quite clearly on the main façade to this day. Before Hadrian became emperor, a number of architects were scathing about his ideas, mocking the domes he sketched as pumpkin drawings. But Hadrian undoubtedly knew a good idea when he saw one. The daring cupola, which crowns the Pantheon, is nothing short of remarkable, holding the record for being the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. The walls of the building are 19 feet thick to support its weight, and if you step past the giant bronze doors that are almost 2,000 years old, you'll get a spectacular view of the oculus, which is the only source of light for the bright and airy interior. The Pantheon was originally a place of worship, to honour the gods of Olympus. But since the days of the Renaissance, it has been both a tomb and a shrine for the kings of Italy, as well as prominent citizens such as the composer Corelli and the great artist Raphael. Close to the Pantheon, you'll find many glorious sites, such as the beautiful Baroque church, Sant'Agnese in Agone, stands in one of the most popular squares in Rome, Piazza Navona. Here you can take a moment to enjoy the fountains designed by Bernini and soak up the Italian atmosphere. However, if you prefer to take yourself off the main tourist trail and explore some of the narrow alleyways off the beaten track, you may find yourself stumbling upon one of the Italian papacy's most breathtaking creations, unmistakably glorious Trevi Fountain. Gazing at the beautiful figures sculpted by Nicola Salvi come as no surprise that the theme of this spectacular fountain is the taming of the waters. At the centre, a colossus of Neptune sits upon a chariot guided by two sea horses. On either side, two tritons stand, one struggling to master an unruly seahorse and the other leading a more docile creature, symbolising the contrasting moods of the sea. Tumbling 
cascades are at times reminiscent of mountain brooks. And if the sight of the Trevi Fountain is enough to make you want to return to Rome, you should follow the old tradition of throwing a coin into its waters, which is supposed to ensure a return trip. But now, let's take a break from history, art and architecture, and as dusk falls over the Italian capital, you'll find quite a different city comes to life. Exploring Rome after dark can be equally as magical as experiencing the city by day in the vibrant Italian sunshine, and with fountains and monuments vividly lighting up the night sky. A gentle evening stroll through the squares and winding streets can be a delightful way to do a little sightseeing in slightly calmer surroundings. But there's another side to Rome that we've yet to reveal. If fashion happens to be something that you follow, it's unlikely to come as too much of a surprise. If you venture down Via Condotti, you'll find yourself in one of Rome's most stylish areas, and wandering amongst the Italian shoppers, perusing the designer goods elegantly displayed in the shop windows will be an intriguing experience. Although you'll undoubtedly be tempted, a quick glance at the price tags will generally get you back on the straight and Wandering through this maze of highly fashionable streets can be every bit as fascinating as exploring Rome's galleries and museums. But if you do decide to pay a visit to Via Condotti by night, do make sure you come back again in daylight, because at its head lies one of Rome's most popular attractions. For centuries, Piazza di Spagna has been a favourite haunt for tourists and expatriates alike, with a charm that is truly unique. The dawn of the 19th century, the square was at the centre of the city's main hotel district, and many artists, writers and poets passed this way. Some of them even became more permanent residents, and one of the most notable of these was the English Romantic poet John Keats, who stayed at a house on the corner of the Spanish Steps in 1820. He was often joined here by his great friend, the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, and the renamed Keats Shelley Memorial House commemorates the fact that Keats spent the last few months of his life here before dying at the tender age of 25. Keats and Shelley aren't the only English influence in this area, however. If you prefer a change from the espressos and lattes on offer in the typical Italian bars, you can visit the quintessentially English Babington Tea Rooms that also overlook the square. The star attraction of Piazza di Spagna is, of course, the elegant stairway, which is known as the Spanish Steps. Here, people can pause to rest from the rush of the day, taking time out of their busy schedules to enjoy the morning sun and absorb surroundings rich in style, culture and history. And with a last look at the Spanish Square, one of the liveliest areas in the city, our journey through the winding narrow streets and broad sweeping boulevards of Rome has sadly drawn to a close. Even a lifetime would perhaps not give you enough hours to explore all of the city's delightful treasures. But hopefully, this brief glimpse at the spectacular architecture, ancient monuments and breathtaking museums of the Italian capital will have given you the opportunity to soak up at least a little of the irresistible atmosphere of this truly eternal city.